to be clear, those intersections that Chuck is talking about are where the majority of serious accidents are happening and people are like, yes. lives are forever changing because those are the most dangerous intersections, the, the most dangerous intersections out there. And not only that, they're very common, um, especially around where I live. There'll be huge like box trucks parked on each side and you have to creep an uncomfortable amount. And whatever amount you have to creep, the car has to creep that one foot more. You know what I mean? That... Um, that could be potentially dangerous, but I'll give you what I think of as the best and worst case scenario. So that kind of jumps into this tweet real quick. Let me go ahead and pull it up. This was in response to uh, Robert Scoble. Tesla AI is very underrated, had two AI founders while my car drove us through SF. If you have a friend with FSD, beg them for a ride. If you think Elon Musk has competition, you're simply wrong. There is none. And then Elon Musk replied to this in the morning, 12 to 43, my time central. Yeah, 99% of people have no idea. An improvement will accelerate dramatically now that we are no longer AI training compute constrained. And so for those that are not familiar, in sort of non-technical terms, what that means is that for, for this version 12 thing where the AI brain is learning how to drive. The challenge Tesla has had has been having enough computer chips to process the data they had to make the system feel better. And what's sort of interesting about what you're saying and what this comment implies is that between 12.1 and 12.3, they were uh, hardware constrained. So those massive improvements we've seen were during a time where they've been hardware constrained and they didn't have the compute to go as fast as they could. And they still made significantly faster progress than they ever have before in critical areas with a brand new approach. And I, like all those variables put together is kind of shocking to think through. And now the implications here is, is okay, so we've solved the hardware problem for now. And now it's a becomes a data thing where we need to feed them more data to get better. And it also sounds like, at least from the guidance we got from Tesla at one of their quarterly earnings reports, was that the or one of their meetings, I forget what it was, they're going to they're not going to stop here. They're going to add more hardware. And so and they're going to get more data. So like it will get better faster. So how do you think through that, J.D.? And then Hans as well. I'd love to hear both your takes on this. I recently watched an interview with Sam Altman where he basically said, like, compute power is going to be the currency of the future. Um, and I think that's completely probably valid um, where Tesla might have all the data in the world, but unless they have the, the, the training, like the system capable of putting that into a model that drives the car. Well, like you can't do anything with it. And it's super, it was actually pretty shocking to me to see that tweet from Elon saying that they're no longer uh, compute restrained because that either means they have a ton of H 100s or like Dojo is coming online um, either way, you know, like it's, it's, it's happening. I think the, I think Elon even thanked the CEO of NVIDIA for like selling him and like prioritizing him to give him the, uh, the compute power needed, which is just like, what, what a crazy situation. Like if you really think about that, um, but yeah, I think the, I think the future has AI all over it. I don't just like, just like the very beginning part of that tweet is like 99% of people just do not understand. They, they think everything's going to be like staying the same um, or we're going to see progress like we've seen progress in the past. And I just, I don't think so. I think it's going to start really accelerating. So I, it's really both at this point, as far as I know it, that there's a large portion that is NVIDIA. They are bringing online Dojo as well. It seems like it's probably mostly NVIDIA and, you know, People have mentioned it, they could also be adding in AMD hardware. Like it's not out of the realm of possibility that they are even supplementing whatever they have with other providers as well. But yeah, there's really no one right now who's delivering cost efficiency that NVIDIA is delivering for this high performance AI training compute. The The DGX series of supercomputers is just bananas and um it's incredible to see how fast that is progressing um there was a, a tweet that brad gerstner shared earlier this week that said you know moore's law equates to basically a 30 times improvement in basically you know dollars per compute over 10 years and that under jensen nvidia from 
the initial DGX computer that they delivered, that first one that he delivered to OpenAI back when Elon Musk was still involved. Um, from then until the most recent, the GB200, which is the the new one that they just announced, is a 3,600 times increase. And that, yeah, these new ones, you know, they could have trained GPT-4 with one-tenth of the GPUs that OpenAI used originally and only using a quarter of the power. So, and the power is really where the cost comes from, that it's four times cheaper today to train GPT-4 than it was however long ago they were doing that training run, whether it was 12 months or, you know, 18 months. Um, And that is bananas because it's really that, like capacity and power efficiency cost that is the bottleneck for, you know, all these incredible new AI applications. And like, you know, FSD is one of the four most real world applications of this technology, but it's, it's going to start impacting more and more things. Obviously the humanoid robot form factor is going to be one of those. Um, Not only is Elon working on all of that with, the Optimus robot program, but Jensen is also <laughs> kind of aggressively targeting that space, uh, partnering with a whole bunch of people, trying to be an infrastructure provider for a lot of people that want to do things in that area. And yeah, so just like you said, the people are not even beginning to fathom and comprehend the amount of change in the goods and services that are going to be available to humans in the very near future for prices that would seem unreasonably cheap today. And that is both incredibly exciting, also, you know, somewhat scary. Um, there was one question that I, I wanted to ask you, JD, on the because you I don't know if you have insight into this, but you may. Um, there's how how long is the overall QC process from when a training run of the the core FSD model is done, like how many weeks worth of internal testing does that usually go through before it first rolls out to somebody like Omar? And then, yeah, because I think that's that's one of those extra pieces that I don't know how much of a preview that the the Tesla team is getting on. Like, I'm assuming that that's part of why Elon said that, you know, they've they already know what the next three releases are going to be. And how fast they're going to come? Because I I think that they're all you know all of those three training runs have already been completed and they're just in the final stages of internal quality control. So yeah, just is there any insight that you can give to to that process? Yeah, to be clear, I never really worked around the uh, autopilot team at all. Um, I was able to get earlier releases along with the other employees who had you know like full self driving on their car, but I never. I never got an insight into um, how long they were testing it before we received it. But even like, I feel like even if I did version 12 is just such a dramatic way, like different way of doing things that it might've not even mattered. I think they're probably going, they're probably doing things way differently than they were with, uh, with version 11. And it does sound like to me that they're pretty far ahead. Um, We have, people on the autopilot team kind of posting teasers about like certain models combining and um, stuff that is not going to happen for months. So like, I I definitely think we're still on the compute constrained version of full self-driving right now. And even 12.4 might be the, the same thing, but I think what they're working on right now, we might not see it for a few months. I think Elon hinted like April or May or something, but like that doesn't seem like very, far along to me so i think it's like this i just don't see how this doesn't become the breakthrough that all of us i feel like have been predicting for the better part of like four or five years it just seems like all the bones are there you have a tool that understands reality that is able to create actions based on that reality that is constrained by how many chips and how much data you have okay the chip equation is being solved right before our eyes, especially through NVIDIA, where they are coming out with hardware 
that is not only making they're not only making more hardware for people to do the computation, but each piece of hardware is becoming significantly better at doing so per piece of hardware at a fraction of the energy used, right? So we multiplier effect on how much compute power you'll have as you go into the next few years. So it's not just like throw H100s at it, but it's like throw the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth generation of the H100, which will do whatever, two, three, four, five X the capability of the current one. And then you have a company that's, and this is where, again, Hans is so good at creating terminology. You're like a freaking encyclopedia of cool, te cool terminology. Tesla has a search engine. So what is a search engine? It's all the five, 5 million, 5.5 million cars all over the roads right now collecting the data that Tesla can then use those increasingly more uh, capable chips to teach the AI how to drive in every situation, right? And then the logical question becomes, what, wh okay, so what, what would keep Tesla from being able to have a self-driving car? And to me, it's like two questions, and, and, and I'd love to explore these with you guys. So number one, the regulatory piece, which seems like it's gonna be the biggest bottleneck, especially in places like say Europe or, or China or, India, depending on the kind of variables that you have that are going to make it difficult to come out with a vehicle that can drive itself. But there is also certain jurisdictions in the United States that are allowing are, are already allowing people to self-drive the cars. So it's like it becomes a function of time and proving out that the technology works. But then the other limiting factor to say, okay, so this is not going to work is the hardware placement. So the cameras, right? Do they have the right set of cameras? Are they in the right place? And when we're talking with Chuck Cook, uh, Cook earlier this week, which is another fantastic channel that does uh, covers uh, FSD and how it progresses over time, he still, uh, which I truly respect his his opinion because he's he's very you know seems to be very well versed in this area. He still feels like for a true robo taxi solution you need better camera placements but then when i go outside and i put you know this is a stupid this is the, the dumbest example i can use but i literally take my phone and then i put the camera next to the b pillar and then i put the camera next to like the area where the car say it's optimally positioned uh, say a, a side view mirror looking camera say at the headlight or something and i look at it on the video i'm like it's not that different it's, you don't really get that big of a of a difference. Yeah, you, you might get a, maybe an additional foot, foot and a half of clearance or whatever, and you might not have to creep as far, but it looks kind of the same. So is and if and if hardware was really the limiting factor here, why didn't they make the change, you know, five years ago, four years ago, three years ago? Why they're still cranking out all these cars with these cameras? So I'm curious to get y'all's takes on this. Like, how are you guys thinking about the let, let me put it in a much simpler term. I would be shocked if this is not level five or level four, right? Please tell me how dumb I am. Somebody. <laughs> or did I bring the wrong people? <laughs> no, like to be clear, those intersections that Chuck is talking about are where the majority of serious accidents are happening and people are like, yes. lives are forever changing because those are the most dangerous intersections the, the most dangerous intersections out there. Not only that, they're very common, um, especially around where I live. There'll be huge like box trucks parked on each side and you have to creep an uncomfortable amount. And whatever amount you have to creep, the car has to creep that one foot more. You know what I mean? That um, that could be potentially dangerous. But I'll give you what I think of as the best and worst case scenario. I think if say they want to do like level five, like you say, maybe just within a certain bounded area. I'm not even, I'm not even sure of the driving levels. I read it a while ago. I don't even really know, to be honest with you, but say like they're going to take the Waymo approach and go through San Francisco. Right. I think the easiest approach that they could possibly do is, and they wouldn't even have to change full self-driving at all or the model running the car. All they would have to do is modify the navigation routes so that it would just, instead of making that unprotected left, it'll make three rights. Um, and that is something that actually Waymo already does. There's a lot of videos I watch of people tr like stress testing the Waymo and going through these areas. And you can see on the visualizations, there's these red areas where the Waymo is just not able to go, 
even though it's technically within their bounds or whatever, they just don't allow the car to go through that intersection because statistically speaking, there's a much higher likelihood of an accident there. So to me, it seems like obvious, like when they're really ready to roll this out as a, as a robo taxi, we'll call it like all they have to do is modify the nut to navigation to say, prefer not doing this turn if at all possible. If you absolutely have to, like maybe, but like, even if you have to do a three point turn down this street, just don't go through that intersection. I would say that's the best case scenario. If that doesn't happen, I feel like the side repeater cameras on the car are probably the easiest to replace of out of any of the cameras. And if they just increase the field of view another 10 or 20 degrees, like the problem is solved. And, um, you know, I don't think that would be like, yeah, re replacing those cameras on millions and millions of cars could get very expensive. But when we're talking like if it could actually if it could actually behave as a robo taxi, that becomes like chump change. It's like very cheap to do that to all the cars.